pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that we can enjoy your grace and goodness to us for everything that you've given us. We thank you for the gospel, most of all, in Christ, that you have uh, paid for our sins, that you have justified us through his death and resurrection. We thank you for the Spirit making us alive together with Christ. Lord, I thank you that we can come before you and study your word that you've given your uh, sufficient, inerrant word for us to be able to know you and know how to worship you and uh, know how to love you more. Lord, I pray that tonight as your word goes forth that I would not get in the way of your Holy Spirit and that you would remove all impediments of our flesh in understanding your truth. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so we're in Genesis uh, 35, and this chapter is a key, uh, key chapter in the shift of the book. Uh, it's a historical shift that takes place that finishes up with Genesis chapter 35. Uh, one thing that I'd like to mention, I made a little list up here, and I, I have these in my notes, and you can, I'll make those available if you want to, this information. So don't, what I'm saying is don't try to write this down, because then people will be writing it down the whole time, and you'll miss everything else. So this is, uh, but Genesis is uh, actually divided into 12, uh, 10 sections, uh, and these are the 10 sections. It's divided into 10 sort of books, or volumes, or logs or episodes uh, that are openings and closings of certain key elements of the book. Uh, and I'll just go through them real quick. It, this is something called, um, and you'll know what I'm talking about when I say what this means. This is something in Genesis that we see, and this is a Hebrew word called the Toledot. Uh, this is a Hebrew term, and we've seen it a few times throughout Genesis. Uh, it means, it, it's the phrase in Hebrew, these are the generations of, or this is the book of the generations of, and it continues into, it closes, and then another section starts. And so these are all the sections where that's broken up. So there's, there's God opening up kind of the book of Genesis, God's dealings with man, Adam, first man, continuing forth after the fall, and his sons, Noah and his sons, Shem, Hem, and Japheth, the uh, survivors of the flood who would live in a post-flood world. Shem, the focus for the Hebrew people and uh, the coming of the Messiah would come through Shem. Terah, this is Abraham's father. Uh, Abra he has three sons, one of which is the father of Lot, who is important, and one of which is the grandfather of uh, Rebekah, who also becomes an important part of Genesis. Uh, then there is Abraham's oldest son, Ishmael. It gives a little bit on him. And then we come to, in Genesis chapter 25, Isaac. And this is the one that we're in. This is, chapter 35 is the closing out of Isaac. I titled it, The End of <coughs> Isaac's History. Now, something that may come up is that we haven't heard about Isaac for quite a while. And I'll explain uh, what that is as we get into it. Uh, but just be aware that, this is, that there are certain sections that divide the book of Genesis. Uh, and the, and we're, we're in the descendants or the generations or the book of Isaac at this point. Uh, but basically Isaac's book, his volume, has been taken up with Jacob. Jacob is the one who has gotten the blessing from God. And the, the narrative has focused almost exclusively on him. Uh, there's some interesting theories out there about uh, who wrote Genesis. They agree that Moses was obviously a key writer in Genesis, but some believe that, uh, that some of these men actually may have written down parts of Genesis that Moses would have had access to and by the guidance of the Holy Spirit kind of been the editor of the book and had access to some of those things in Egypt. But that's not important. That's just for your information. But anyway, so in Genesis 35, we see this culmination of events. It's, it's not a uh, chapter that you would probably read in Sunday school. It's nothing that's like, uh, it's important, but it's nothing that's like, I said earlier, it's, there's not a ton of showstoppers in it. It's not, like, uh, it's not like Joseph or Adam or something like that that, that we 
typically focus in on. So this may be a chapter uh, we haven't read too carefully before. So let's start in Genesis 35, verses 1 through 4. Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments, and let us arise and go to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all their foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. All right, we can stop there and talk a little bit about uh, what's going on here. So it's been a few years since Jacob's come back. In Genesis 28, over 20 years ago, Jacob promised, Lord, if you return me to this land, to my father's house in safety, uh, he basically swears allegiance to the Lord, swears to give him a tithe, and he's come back. He's now in the land, and the Lord comes to him and says, it's time to pay that vow. It's been about eight to ten years at this point. Uh, God takes vows extremely seriously. I'll just read another Old Testament verse on that topic. Numbers 30 verse 2 says, If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Which means Jacob promised to give a tithe to the Lord. He promised to do certain things, and God is now calling him on that promise. Uh, so he called, God had called Jacob back to Bethel. And the unique thing about this place, Bethel, is this is kind of where everything started. This is where Abraham uh, started out for. This is the place where Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Genesis 12, 8, speaking of Abraham, says, Then he proceeded from the mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the east and Ai on the uh, uh, Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. So we see that Jacob is now returning to this very important historical piece of gra uh, ground where his grandfather had been called and began to worship the Lord. But we see a huge um, issue with the family of Jacob. Now remember, these are the descendants of Abraham. These are Abraham's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. This is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his sons, the patriarchs. You know, we think of the, the Bible stories with the cartoons of these guys, of these great men of faith, and they were in some instances. But now Jacob, before he goes and builds this altar to the Lord, he has to get his whole family together and say, put away all foreign gods. Now, that should seem strange to us. This is, this is the family of God. This is the family on earth who had access to the true and living God. This is the family who knew the Lord. And, and Jacob has to come to his family, not, not some outside group, but his own family, and say, put away all your idols. Get rid of them before we go to worship the Lord. And so, and, uh, just throughout this, uh, in narrative, biblical narrative, it's not... Uh, always expedient to do an outline, you know, there's not always three clear uh, points in biblical narrative, but there are some uh, principles that we can draw throughout, and one of them uh, that I think is important for us to draw here is that it is important to seek repentance before worship. So Jacob is commanded by God to return and render worship as a family, but first family-wide repentance was required because of idolatry. And so God is not going to accept worship. God is not going to accept, he's not going to share. He's not going to share the throne of anyone's heart. He demands total and exclusive worship. And in this point, we see that idolatry has come into Jacob's family and that at, it seems until this point, while he may have continued to worship God faithfully, he's allowed his family to, to kind of go by the wayside, kind of do their own thing. And here Jacob kind of comes and with the prodding of the Lord reasserts his family leadership. He says, no, we're, we're not going to do the idols. We're not going to have any dealings with the foreign gods. Put those away so we can worship the true God. Another uh, thing that we can draw here is that idolatry 
naturally finds its way into worship when the truth is ignored. We are all worshipers, whether we are worshipers of God or whether we are worshipers of something else. And when the truth of the word of God is ignored, idolatry is the natural result. And this is, as I said before, this is the one family you would think on earth at this time should be free from idolatry. But they go along with the idolatry of the culture. So how much more should we be vigilant about avoiding idolatry in our own heart and lives? Uh, So the obvious question is kind of where did these come from? Well, unfortunately, Rachel, you know, one of... One of the mothers of one of the names we think of big names in Genesis, Rachel, when they left her father's house and uh, left her father Laban, she stole his household gods and he pursued them and she hid them under uh, her camel's saddle. And she probably still had them to this time. So it's very likely that Rachel was the one who introduced idolatry into the family. We also uh, went over a few weeks ago when Stephen taught uh, uh, Simeon and Levi, Jacob's second and third sons, sacked a city and killed all the male inhabitants and looted it. Uh, they sacked the city of Shechem, and they probably picked up, you know, God here, some money, you know, whatever. They probably picked up even more foreign gods, and it was probably a natural result. Hey, if, you know, if mom does it, it can't be that big of a deal, right? And so, so this has been going on for quite a while, and at this point, Jacob finally says, enough. Uh, one of the key points in the Ten Commandments, it encompasses, this theme encompasses both the first and second commandments. That's how important it is uh, to God, it is Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So God takes idolatry extremely seriously. His, the first commandment is not to have any other gods before him. And idolatry kind of takes uh, three different flavors. It can, it can mix, but these are kind of the uh, three different ways to idolize something. One is worship of any other god. This can be idols. This can be worship of just heart idols that without bowing down to a certain deity, but treating something as God that is not God. Uh, This is Romans 1, treating things as God, being worshipers of whatever we choose. And uh, just as an interesting side note for as a worldview issue is some people actually translate that verse, you shall have no other gods before me as, okay, well, God's just talking about the order. You can, have, you can have other gods, but just as long as God's number one, you know, no big deal. That's, uh, I actually got into a conversation uh, with a philosophy of religion professor over email about this issue. He used to be a preacher, and he, he made the claim that Judaism was not monotheistic, meaning worshiping one God, but rather henotheistic, which means while they exclusively are committed to one God, they acknowledge that there are other gods that exist. And so I don't know how that's logically possible, being who God is, that there can't be another God. It's just not not possible in any sense. But just so you know, that is something that uh, may come up in this verse. But in the uh, New American Standard uh, footnote, it's, it, that word before can also be uh, besides. You shall have no other God besides me. Meaning, if there's a God, it is the Lord. That's what it's saying. Another one is uh, creating an image. And this can be done throughout, actually, th- with making an image. Isaiah 44 talks about carving, a tr- uh, cutting down a tree, using half for fire to cook food, and then bowing down and worshiping the other half. He talks about it in an extremely uh, 
bitterly sarcastic terms to show how uh, ridiculous idolatry is. But creating an image of God it can also be the idea of creating a God in our own image, meaning we bring God down to the level of human things. Uh, maybe you've heard, this, I call this uh, Oprah theology, maybe you've heard people say, well, my God would not do such and such. My God would never send people to hell. My God is not a homophobe. My God is not this or that. And this is extremely common in our relativistic uh, culture that y your God is okay for you. You can have your God. You can make him whatever you want or her whatever you want. And that's fine as long as your God doesn't infringe on anyone else. And that's extremely uh, dangerous. People creating an idea of God and then worshiping that idea because it looks exactly like themselves. And this is extremely common even in Bible-believing churches that people come in, they keep the parts of the Bible they like, that say things like, okay, God is love, I'm, I'm cool with that, but then, you know, the God hates all who do iniquity, no, I'm not, I'm not cool with that, so my God isn't like that. And so that's creating an image. And another one that uh, we often don't think about, but this really creeps into uh, Christianity, is worship of the true God through the use of images. Meaning, using images for worship is idolatry. Uh, it is trying to bring God down to a human level. The Romans 1 talks about this. They reduce the creator down to the level of the creation and worship four-footed animals and creeping things and lizards and so on. And uh, an, an example of this in the Bible is in Exodus 32 when they made the golden calf. They're not creating some new God. They're saying, this is the God. This is the rep representation of our God who brought us out of Egypt. They were trying to create a likeness of Yahweh and God took that extremely seriously. And this is done often through uh, worship of saints. People, sometimes people try to worship uh, through a, looking at a cross. I mean, a cross is obviously what we're centered around. But some people try to worship through looking at a cross, through looking at a picture of Jesus, through coming up with a picture of what they think Jesus looks like in their head to help their worship. And the Bible calls that idolatry. Uh, John Calvin writes on this passage, how great is the propensity of mankind to impious and vicious worship. Meaning we have a natural bent toward wrong worship. And the thing is, we may acknowledge that, we may give assent to that, but we need to realize that we need an outside, more powerful, holy force to tell us and guide us into true worship, or else we will worship falsely. And that, that's, what the, that's what the Bible is saying here. Uh, true worship also involves, and we see this in the story of Jacob, putting away idols. So Jacob confesses his own negligence, reasserts his authority as spiritual head of the family, and then confesses that he's left this door open, basically, for his family to continue on in idolatry. And so this is a turning point. They're turning from idols to serve the living and true God. And this shows, this passage shows how gracious God was not to, he didn't reject this family. He, he didn't, the, the family of God, they're real people. They struggled with sin and idolatry and serious things. Just, I mean, you ever read the book of Genesis? Just when you think this family can't get any lower, it does into idolatry and immorality and all kinds of other things. But this is the family that God has chosen. And so it shows his infinite goodness to continue using this family. Uh, Joshua 24, 14 and 15 says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river. That might be referring to this very event. And in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
So we see all throughout Scripture, this is, and this is what we call people too as believers, and this is what we're striving for too, is choose who you're going to serve and serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, so Jacob comes and confronts this, and I think this shows an example that leadership must confront sin uh, regularly and publicly, meaning coming before people and saying, this is wrong, you need to be focused on this, of someone who comes in uh, and has discernment, that's an important thing in the church. And Jacob is modeling this here. He had to deal with the issue publicly. He didn't go to each family member and say, okay, can you, can you cool it with the idols for, you know, so we can worship? He, he gets the whole family together and says, this is where it stops, and we're going to worship the true and living God. Uh, John Calvin also writes, Wherefore, we must boldly resist those beginnings of evil, lest the true religion should be injured by the sloth and silence of pastors. So he connects that with today, that you have to make a big deal out of the things that Scripture makes a big deal of and take those things seriously. And so Jacob orders his family to purify themselves and change their garments as a sign of repentance. Uh, this is also done in Exodus and Leviticus as a sign of showing that someone was renewed uh, in worship before God. Uh, let's pick up in verse 5 and go through verse 8. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there the Lord had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below, Beth, uh, below Bethel under the oak, and it was called Alan Bacchus. Okay, we can stop there. So we see that as Jacob travels that uh, with his family that the city-states surrounding them don't pursue them and don't attack them. And uh, if you read back in Genesis 34, we see the reasoning of why these other states might, uh, why these other groups and tribes uh, might attack them. Jacob was now seen as a warlord and a belligerent aggressor. I believe the the end of Genesis 34 in the New King James, he, says, he speaks to his son Simeon Levi, who had just killed all the men of Shechem, and says, you've now made me obnoxious in the sight of all the people. Meaning, now they're going to think I'm ready for a fight, and I'm not able to do that. And so before he had been seen as just a harmless shepherd with his family, and now he's seen as this guy who's trying to take over through conquest. But God uh, sovereignly controls the hearts of men by putting the fear of Jacob's family on them. This is the terror of the Lord. And this shows that the hearts of men, even unsaved, ungodly, unregenerate people, are sovereignly in God's control. And this is good for us to remember when we deal with difficult people, that... <clears throat> Our enemies, whoever we have to deal with, cannot go any further than God allows them to. Uh, reading from John Calvin's commentary, he says, Wherefore, whenever we see the wicked furiously bent on our destruction, meaning whenever the deck is stacked against us from whoever it is, lest our hearts should fail with fear and be broken by desperation, let us call to mind the terror of God by which the rage, however furious, of the whole world may be easily subdued. Meaning, God may be protecting us in ways we don't even know. Here, Jacob was protected in a way he wasn't even aware of. And so later on throughout the history of Israel, we see other verses where this comes up, where Israel is vulnerable, where they're walking through a certain area and the terror of the Lord is upon the other nations so that they're not attacked. And this is extremely important. We see God preserving this family because this is where the Messiah will come through. He's protecting this family for his greater 
purpose. And so Jacob finally returned to the place where he had started out from in Genesis 28. Uh, Jacob had named the place Bethel because the Lord had appeared to him there, and Bethel means the house of God. And previously, the place was called Luz. And so, and then we get kind of a verse that just kind of seems to pop out of nowhere. It says, we read of the death of a woman named Deborah. And we find out she's Rebecca's nurse and that she was buried. And so we have little information about her in Genesis before this. All we know is that she left with Rebecca when Rebecca was taken uh, to marry Isaac. It's, uh, it mentions in Genesis 24, 59 that her nurse went with her and that's, that's all we get. Uh, but it is clear that her, her name being mentioned in scripture shows that she's a faithful slave of the family and who is worthy enough to be mentioned in scripture when she died, which is a pretty uh, big honor. I'll, I'll point out that uh, even Rebecca, one of the big names in Genesis, you know, you think of Genesis, you think of, okay, Adam, uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Jacob. You think of these big names. But Rebecca, it, the Bible never reports on how she died, where she was buried. It never says anything about Rebecca. But it comes in and points to Rebecca's nurse and where she died and that she was with Jacob. So it's likely she was a close uh, companion of Jacob and that Rebecca was not mentioned probably because she was involved in trying to deceive Isaac so that Jacob could steal the blessing in Genesis 27. And so the mention of people like this in scripture, it's obscure. There's not, there's not a lot to pull out of it. Uh, but there are a few things that we can notice just because it's there. One is that Genesis is not a myth. It, it is not mythological. Myth, mythologies don't mention the death of certain specific people that other histories never point out. It, it, it doesn't say where they're buried in a place that you can go back and look at to this day. It doesn't, uh, the Odyssey, the Iliad, no, nothing does this like the Bible. Genesis is not myth. It mentions specific people uh, in specific places. And so, and no other, no other history in the world does that. Uh, down to people like this one slave woman who's mentioned once as part of uh, Isaac and Rebecca's family. And then two, this is just something to remember, is that God remembers faithful people even when they're not prominent. We hadn't even gotten this woman's name up until this point. We haven't heard anything about her. We don't know anything about her life. But as I said before, Rebecca's one of the big names in Genesis, and, she, and her death isn't mentioned. But this slave, who is the nurse of, uh, of Rebecca, is mentioned. So I think that God, that God rewards faithfulness even when people aren't prominent. They're not the first ones seen. Rebecca's extremely important, but I think that the mention of Deborah here uh, shows us something else. She, it reminds me of uh, Eliezer, Abraham's slave who went to find Rebecca in Genesis 24, and it never mentions his name in Genesis 24, but he goes, he trusts the Lord, and he's memorialized, just like Rebecca, permanently in Scripture. And so uh, a commentary by this guy named H.C. Leupold says, uh, more important to observe is the fact that scripture regards the death and burial of this menial worthy of notice, meaning this lowly person, scripture takes notice of that. And so this probably points to the uh, place that Deborah had in Jacob's life. She was probably uh, like another mother to him. She probably was like, uh, was very close to Jacob throughout his life. Uh, a modern day example of this would be, have you guys seen, who in here has seen the movie They Help? Okay, you guys, if you haven't seen it, uh, these black women in the 60s would take care of these kids and often grow closer to them than sometimes even their parents would. And so you can kind of, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what happened, but you can kind of see that, uh, that maybe that closeness was between Jacob and, uh, and Deborah here. And so he buries her in a place of honor. He n names the place, um, in, in that word there, Alan Bakuth, means oak of weeping.
which means this was a sorrowful death for his whole family. Uh, Let's pick up in verses 9 through 15. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall you be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come forth from you, and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Let's stop there. So remember that the last of Jacob's two sons, uh, uh, in the last chapter, Jacob's Two of Jacob's sons, the second and third born, Simeon and Levi, uh, told the whole city of Shechem to be circumcised to become part of the family. And then it says in the third day, when they were still in pain, that Simeon and Levi went in and killed the whole, all the men of the city. Uh, because they had, because one man... Uh, had raped their sister Dinah. That's in Genesis 34. So, obviously they had a right to be upset, but they killed a whole city over this. And now Jacob is extremely distressed at this point. Uh, He's thinking that the people around him are going to plot to destroy him. And so, how does God comfort Jacob? Uh, John Calvin comments on this section. Now, I want you to notice the words in Genesis 35, 10, that God said to him. Uh, John Calvin picks up on that and says, uh, The Lord spoke. Why did God, not by a miracle, translate him to some other place and thus immediately remove him from all danger? Meaning, couldn't God have made this whole ordeal a lot simpler? He says, Moses does not insist upon this point in vain, meaning that it is important that he points out God came and spoke to Jacob. It is the principal business of our life to depend on the word of God. For seeing, you'll like this one, uh, John Calvin's very uh, diplomatic. For seeing that we are slow and dull, which we are, <laughs> let's just be honest about it. Bare experience by no means suffices to attest the favor of God towards us, unless faith arising from the word be added. Meaning, John Calvin points here and says, Jacob's comfort comes from the word of God. There's, he's not having faith in some nebulous idea of, okay, I kind of believe that there's a God out there who's looking out for me. It's that God has said certain things and that God comes and speaks to him again. And he draws the conclusion that our business of life is to put our faith on what God has said. He says our experience isn't enough to tell us anything. He says our experience is only bolstered by the word of God. And so this is the principle to draw, is that God comforts his people through his word. This is how he comfort, comforted Jacob. He didn't use some great miracle that Jacob could see. God had his protection over him by uh, putting terror on the surrounding nations and tribes, but Jacob didn't know that. And God doesn't tell him that. God comes and reaffirms the covenant that he had made with Abraham, that he had made with Isaac, and that he had already made with Jacob. He reaffirms that. And he does that in certain ways. He, he reaffirms that Jacob has been given a change of name. Now, throughout Scripture, the, Jacob, uh, the nation of Israel is referred to officially as Israel, but it goes back and forth between Jacob and Israel. And... Th- uh, We see that this in Genesis 32 was the name given after Jacob had wrestled with God in human flesh. He wrestles with him. He says, I will not go unless you bless me. 
God says, what is your name? He says, Jacob, which means liar, supplanter, trickster. He was admitting his identity, and God says, no longer shall your name be Jacob, but your name shall be Israel, because you have uh, strove with God and men and have survived, is basically what God says. Uh, remember also, it's just kind of a fun fact, just to kind of connect this to something that maybe we're more familiar with, that Jesus also has this practice of changing names of people. Simon, he changes to Peter. And it's really interesting if you go through the Gospels, when Peter's doing the right thing, and he's really right on, Jesus refers to him as Peter, or Simon Peter, if he's kind of mixed. And if, he, and if he's doing something wrong, Jesus goes back to calling him Simon. It's really interesting, because uh, Peter means the rock. When he's acting rock-like, that's what Jesus refers to him as. And at the end of his life, Peter writes his letter, and he refers to himself as Simon Peter. Just a fun fact. But uh, that, that we see the same God is changing, uh, that, that changes people, that changed Peter's name, and the other disciples changed Jacob's name. We also see that he changed uh, Abram's name to Abraham, Genesis 17.5. No longer shall you be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And this is before Isaac was even born. So think of that. He's, all right, you're the father of a multitude of nations, and Abraham's not seeing any of this in real time at this point. And God also affirms to him uh, this change of name and his covenant by referring to his own name. He says his name is God Almighty. This is the name El Shaddai. Is what God, God also referred to himself as God Almighty when he spoke to Abraham in Genesis 17.1. He comes to him and says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And then he, re- he reaffirms something that we've heard way back in Genesis. He, he says, he gives him the covenant blessing of be fruitful and multiply. Now, we were hearing that back with Adam and Noah. That's back in Genesis 1 and Genesis 9. And he comes to Jacob and says this again. And so this would be the rule for his family and God's unique purpose for this family because God was involved in creating a nation. And then he, God also promises a nation and a company of nations. This was the confirmation of what had been given to Isaac. Uh, Isaac had said this to Jacob before he had left in Genesis 28, 3, he says, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. And so at this point, when the patriarch spoke, we're like, oh, it really happened. So there, it's not like there's some magic in what Jacob said. It's recorded in Scripture. The Holy Spirit obviously had some meaning behind those words. So when Jacob, when Isaac rather, gave this blessing to Jacob, Uh, It had the force of God's whole promise before it. And he says, not only will you be a nation, but uh, you're going to be a company of nation, meaning nation upon nation. And then this one is exciting for the gospel implications that it has here. He promises that kings will come forth. And it, it says other place in Genesis, this is reported when there is no king in Israel. Uh, there is no king on the throne. There's the patriarchs. There's certain leaders that arise, but there is no official king. And this looks forward to the reign of David, specifically, is what most commentators agree on. Uh, So just as the family of Jacob was promised that all nations would be blessed through them, uh, referring to the Messiah, that's how all the nations get blessed, Galatians 3.8, this connects with God's promise to David that, that a Davidic king, a certain king, would fulfill all the requirements of David correctly. And maybe you guys will re- recognize some of the language from this famous verse, this famous prophecy of a certain Davidic king after David. And it says that the government would be on his shoulders. He would be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, Mighty God. There would be no, incre- no end to the increase of his government. 
and he would sit on the throne of David. So we see these, these, all these covenants of God being connected, and this is referring obviously uh, to Christ. And so the, he says, kings will come forth from you, and that ultimately comes out in the king of kings, in Jesus Christ. And the really exciting thing about this is in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the genealogy of Jesus, it's referring to Jesus and showing how he has legal right to the throne. And he's, and he's referred to as the son of Abraham, and he's also referred to as the son of David, connecting those two, uh, two promises of God together. Uh, Genesis 17.6, this was to Abraham. Uh, it said, I, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come forth from you. So this is another repetition of what had been said before. So Jacob built an altar and this altar connected them with the true worship of God and differentiated them from all the other idolatry and superstition that was going on around them. It's a visible sign of true worship uh, showing that they're unique from idols. Now let's pick up in uh, verses 16 through 21. Uh, then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was still some distance from Ephrath, Ephrath, excuse me, I, it's like, how should I pronounce this? Uh, I should probably read it, right? <laughs> anyway, Rachel began to give birth, and she su- suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she gave him the name Ben-Oni, but uh, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob set a, a pillar over her grave, That is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent toward the Tower of Eder. So in this section, uh, this chapter is important, but it's kind of eclectic. It's just, okay, here, this event happened, this event happened, this event happened. And now we read of the death of Rachel. So she died near a city called Ephrath. Uh, She gave birth to Jacob's twelfth and final son, Benjamin, who completes the tribe of Israel. And her prayer, uh, when she had Joseph, naming him Joseph means, may God add to me another, was she was hoping to have another son, which is why her midwife says, don't worry, you're going to have another son. And she's, you know, it does, her midwife's not just being insensitive while <laughs> poor woman's in severe labor. She, she's actually saying that God's answering your prayer. And so at first, Rachel, she's in such severe labor that she names him uh, Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. Uh, How would you like to go about with a name like that? (laughs) And so because of the pain she has, and she died, and uh, then Jacob changed his name to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand, or it also means son of the south. Kind of like that one. Son of the South. <laughs> and uh, how those two are connected was, uh, if, you, you guys, if you think of a compass, the idea was that someone would be facing east and if your right hand would be facing south. So son of my right hand also means son of the south. That's how it's connected, uh, just so you know. <laughs> and so Rachel died at this, and, but she died at a really important historical Location. It's called Ephrath, which is the ancient name for the city that we know as Bethlehem. And also a landmark is made there. Her grave is, I, I believe it's still there to this day. They have, uh, if you look up, you can look it up on the internet. They have like one of two locations near Bethlehem where they believe Rachel's grave actually is. I think there's a mosque on top of it or something, but like most other, like most other Old Testament graves, unfortunately. But uh, they believe they, that they know where the location of that is. And so even back from the first book of the Bible, we still have historical landmarks that we can trace our way back to. Uh, but this was a place that Moses would have known. He was able to point to others and say, this is where Rachel's grave is to this day. And the exciting place of this, this is the first mention in Scripture of this place, Bethlehem. 
which becomes extremely important if you know your New Testament a little bit. Uh, Micah 5.2 says, uh, now think about it, the, the promise had just come that kings will come forth from you. And this is l- later on in Israel's history. Micah 5.2, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, Jacob's son, who we're reading about in Genesis, from you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His going forths are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And so we see all this tapestry that's come together in, throughout, uh, throughout the testimony of Scripture. And so the verse speaks of this ruler. And this, is, this city, Bethlehem, is also going to be the place of David, the city of David. Uh, let's pick up in verse 22. This is another one of those uh, eclectic reports that Scripture gives, Genesis thirty-five twenty-two. It came about that while Israel was dwelling in the land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Let's stop there. Uh, so Reuben is Jacob's oldest son. And now this may be like, why is this? Okay, but why do we need to know that? I mean, why, why is this? reported here. Well, because typically the line would be passed on through the firstborn. And we see that Reuben comes and does this uh, horrible act of sexual immorality within his own family. John Calvin writes, whereas already two of his sons had been perfidious and sanguinary robbers, meaning Simeon and Levi had gone and killed a whole uh, town of people, and robbed it, the firstborn, Reuben, now exceeds them both in wickedness. So the firstborn does this. this. The next two have gone and killed a whole city and made their father obnoxious and belligerent looking in the sight of all the other nations. And so we're not seeing much hope here for the family of God. I mean, God can't use people like this. But we see that God actually is uh, extremely gracious to this family to continue to use people. And he uses, and who does, out of Jacob's sons, who does, uh, who does the Messiah, Messianic line come through? Judah. Judah. Not number one, not number two, not number three, but number four. And as we'll read in Genesis 38 and 37, he's no hero himself, but we'll get to that later on. But this is extremely important. This, is, this was uh, an extremely immoral relationship. And more than just gratifying his sexual lust, it's thought that Reuben actually tried to sleep with his father's concubine, Bilha to assert authority and say, basically say, I'm taking over now. I've had your concubines, and I'm taking my place as head of the family early. That's basically what they think... Uh, was going on here. So he takes place in this extremely moral, immoral relationship. And it says that an Israel heard of it. It does, doesn't say what he says about it until later on. Uh, but later on in Genesis 49, Jacob's giving a blessing to all his sons. And, and this, is the, this is kind of the blessing he comes to Reuben. He says some nice things. He's like, you're first in my strength. You're in my preeminence. And then he comes... And says in Genesis 49.4 to Reuben, Uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. So we see that Reuben is removed there from the possibility of carrying on this line. Uh, so, and the line would be carried on through Judah. Uh, it, and Reuben is mentioned later in this instance uh, for this sin in First Chronicles 5.1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to his birthright. It's still hearing about this later. I mean, that, that's not something to go down and history in scripture forever for so this is so we see that Reuben is removed and so are Simeon and Levi let's pick up in verse is 22 through 27 almost through this is just a kind of recap of uh, the genealogy I gave you some 
genealogies on your chairs if you want to follow along. Uh, verses 22 through 27. Now there were twelve sons of Jacob, the sons of Leah, Reuben's, uh, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who was born in Paddan Aram. Then uh, Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. So let's stop there. So Jacob's last son, Benjamin, is born, and the genealogy is completed, and it is repeated there. And so Jacob continues on and lives with his father and has finally been returned to his father's house. Uh, and this is also where Sarah was buried. And so let's pick up in verses 28 through 29, and this is, this is the end. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. An old man of ripe age and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Okay, So this is the last that we hear about Isaac. Uh, Isaac is a huge part of Genesis, but we don't hear a lot about him. He has certain key factors that he plays throughout the narrative, but he doesn't have as many chapters as Abraham. He doesn't have as many chapters as Jacob. He's kind of unaggressive, uh, but this is his Toledot. This is where he is focused on. This is his book or his volume or his episode. But why the, the focus hasn't been on him is because he thought he was dying years earlier and tried to pass his blessing on. The blessing got passed to Jacob through deception. And as soon as that blessing was on Jacob, Isaac's whole section shifts and focus, focuses almost exclusively on Jacob. And so we see that Jacob, kind of the unaggressive, uh, passive man that he is, kind of, he enjoys the blessing of God, but gets passed over. And so he dies an old man, ripe with age, uh, filled with life. God is gracious to him. But I, I want to point out something significant here. Uh, Isaac's death is reported here, and this end is his end. We don't hear anything more about him, but he does not actually die in this chapter. His death is just reported here. He actually lives on a few more years. Uh, and there's some, I have a whole mathematical thing that shows that, that he lives another 12 or 13 years if you are interested in some Bible math or something like that. <laughs> Got any Bible math freaks? No? Okay, Josie. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Danielle's not here. Danielle's not here. <laughs> so anyway, but, but here's the significant thing. Jacob, uh, Isaac lives to see all the hardship that Jacob goes through, and he even lives to see Joseph be taken away from him. He, ev he even lives to see uh, Joseph... Uh, it was said to, it's going to be said to Isaac in 37, and Isaac, it's going to be said to Jacob in 37 that uh, Joseph was killed by wild animals when his brother actually, when his brothers actually sold him into slavery. And so Jacob is seeing this and he, he's seeing now, remember who was Isaac's favorite child? Esau. Esau. And who was Rebecca's favorite child? We only, it's, it's one. <laughs> you have, if you get the first one right, or even if you get it wrong, you probably should get the second one right. But yeah, they, he showed, Genesis 25, 28, they both showed family favoritism, and he and Isaac lives to see Jacob favor Joseph and love Joseph more than all his other sons, and he gets to live to see his son make the same mistakes he did, and the pain that caused, and see him lose jo lose Joseph. Uh, and just in closing, now think about it in who Jacob is. You know, we kind of think of him as, okay, Bible character, but, but he's a real person just like us. And the Bible says of him that the Lord 
loved Jacob but hated Esau. Now Esau's had a pretty good life temporally. We've seen that Esau's had it pretty good. He doesn't have to go through some of these things that Jacob's gone through. And the key shift, uh, the key difference, I should say, is that Jacob's life is marked by God's discipline. Jacob comes to the end of his life in Genesis 47, 9, and now it says of all the other patriarchs, they were full of years, they were ripe with age at the right time, you know, they were gathered to their people, basically a peaceful death. He, he comes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh asks him how old he is, he goes, I'm 130, but few and evil have been my days, or few and unpleasant, and he goes, I haven't lived, this is nothing, I haven't lived to anything. Uh, my father, but now listen to listen to some of the things that Jacob went through, and kind of just imagine what this would what this would be like. So he's favored harmfully by his parents. His dad prefers his brother more than him. He had to flee from his brother Esau because his brother wanted to kill him. Genesis twenty seven. He was taken advantage of in marriage and business by his uncle Laban for over 20 years. He re-entered the land and thought Esau was going to kill him and his family with a 400-man army. He wrestled with God and was given a serious injury. His daughter was raped. Following that, his two sons take vigilante justice and kill all the inhabitants of the city because one man had raped uh, their sister. And now he thought all nations were turning against him. His close uh, friend from a young age, Rebecca's nurse Deborah, died. Jacob is never reunited with his mother. Rachel died. His oldest son has intercourse with his concubine slash kind of wife, Bilhah. His sons tell him that Joseph, his favorite son, is killed by wild animals, and he doesn't see Joseph for several more years. His father Isaac dies a few years later. His son Judah would leave the family, marry an unbelieving Canaanite woman, have two evil sons that God will kill, and be tricked into incest with his daughter-in-law because he thought she was a prostitute. He had to suffer through famine for many years. And his son Simeon is captured in Egypt until he's finally reunited with all his family in Egypt. So, this is how God loved Jacob. This is the life that Jacob went through. And we see that God's loving discipline is on him. And that in retrospect, it's easy for us to look back and be like, well, obviously he should have trusted God. I mean, obviously God had a plan throughout the whole thing. It's in the Bible. But... <laughs> You know, and but this is how God shows his love for his chosen people is he disciplines them according to their needs. Uh, John Calvin, just to close out, says, we, therefore, we see, therefore, by what a severe conflict and by what a continued succession of evils he was trained to hope for a better life. M meaning if... If God sees fit in his ultimate wisdom not to give us an easy life in temporal terms, that should just make us long for and hope for heaven just like Jacob did. Or else we'll, we'll turn to the world. We'll, we'll always turn back. If God doesn't keep us saved, if God's discipline and God's sovereign hand on us does not hold us and keep us saved, we would have lost our salvation a long time ago. So let's just think of some of these things and go to prayer, and then we'll go to our discipleship groups. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this uh, chapter and your word and just some of the principles that it teaches us, Lord. And just uh, we thank you just for your word and the mercy that you've given us by telling us how to know you, by telling us how to worship you. Lord, I pray that this week we will learn to love you and serve you better than the last and continue on. Uh, focusing on that for the rest of our lives. Lord, I pray that the discipleship groups will be a time of uh, fruitful discussion, that we'll learn how to pray for one another and how to grow together as brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.